Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's Produce Marketing Association Conference with Food Service Delivered. I'm Sabrina Medora, and I'm here to host a topic on delivery apps. Now, delivery apps have been maintaining a shaky at best reputation within the restaurant industry and with consumers for years, but it's been especially pronounced during the pandemic. So as we look to the future, we're gonna be talking to some experts on what delivery apps need to do to work with restaurants instead of against them. So here today we have Laura Hayes, who is the food editor of Washington City Paper. We have Nick Kokonis, who is the co-owner and co-founder of the Alinea Group, and also the founder and CEO of Talk. And we have David Cabello, who is the CEO and founder of Black and Mobile. So thank you all for joining me today. I'm very excited to chat with you. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Great to be here. So let's get right into it with a question I've had on my mind for a while. Now, when a customer like myself makes a purchase on a delivery app, we typically see something like a delivery fee, we see a driver tip, we see sales tax, all of that comes into the equation, right? And that's about maybe a 10 to $15 increase on whatever the base purchase I'm making is. Now, I hear that companies like Uber Eats, Grubhub, DoorDash, Postmates, they typically also take between 20 and 35% commission per order on top of a monthly fee. So that's a lot of fees, not just for customers, but also for the restaurants. How is this sustainable for restaurants? Is it sustainable for restaurants? David, let's start with you. Um, that business model, I don't think it would be. I do something different where I allow the restaurants to go up on their price of the food that uh, kind of crosses up that 20%. So I charge 20%. I know people charge 30, 35% or more. Um, I charge 20%, but I allow the restaurants to go up 20%. That way they don't take a hit in their margins. So, you know, ultimately, yeah, the customer does pay a little more. Um, but, you know, I'm in it to, you know, help businesses stay alive and, you know, keep, keep the support going to them. So it, it's kind of a hard situation, you know, of who's going to pay more, who's going to pay less, because it's like, you know, we have a business to run. They have a business to run, and then, you know, customers usually support me just because they want to support black businesses. But as far as Uber Eats and all these other services, I don't do any monthly fees. So, you know, I never heard of that as far as getting monthly fees. They, that's definitely sounds like a tech, like they're taxing the restaurants. Um, but I don't know. I really don't know. It's a hard solution. But I definitely think charging over 30% is not fair. I don't think that's fair. Right. And David, just so our audience knows, can you tell us a little bit more about Black and Mobile? Yeah, so Black and Mobile is the first Black-owned food delivery service in the country that exclusively delivers to Black restaurants. So what we do is we find the restaurants that are underrepresented in the city, and we put them on our platform, then we deliver to all the customers in the area. Okay, and is this in your area only? Is it Philadelphia? Philadelphia. We're in Philadelphia. We're in Detroit, and we're launching in Atlanta. I'm actually in Atlanta right now. We're launching tomorrow. Oh, wow. Excellent. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, Nick, tell us a little bit about how Talk deals with these commissions and fees and all of that. Yeah, I mean, Talk started out as a reservation system um, and ticketing system for events, uh, for restaurants, wineries, pop-ups, all of that. We have about 15 million consumers that have accounts, um, and we operate in 28 countries now. Um, when the pandemic hit, we um, very rapidly shifted to take our data structures and rebuild them for, for carryout, um, even more than delivery at first. Um, and we charge a flat 3%. Um, you know, that's enough to pay pay our bills and our engineers and whatnot. We're not really making any money on that. But uh, as a restaurant owner who owns five restaurants, like, you know, we put like one of our restaurants on on uh, DoorDash and, and, and some other platforms, Caviar, uh, three or four years ago. And as soon as I saw the fees, I was like, that's just not sustainable. It's not worth it. Um, they sell just incremental revenue going out your back door. And so people don't really do the math about the labor and all of that. Um, and so what we do is we just charge that flat 3%. We have um, the ability on the software side to let kitchens um, create inventory of different items. And then you can sell add-ons. So if you're selling like, you know, like, you know, a meal kit or something like that, um, you can add on a, a, some wine or a cocktail kit or beverages or even a cookbook if a restaurant has it. So um, we went from doing absolutely no carryout business to over a million dollars a day in a week when we launched it in, in mid-March. That's crazy. And was talk, uh, I know that it was a reservation system. Was it always your intention to build a delivery platform as well? No. Um, and we do do delivery now as well um, through, through the third party um, apps. What we did is we, we twisted their arms and we got them 
to uh, essentially do uh, uh, you know uh, a, a white label like solution for us where they just we have connect with our API it goes to them um, and then what we did is we negotiated a flat fee so for all of New York City the consumer if they can go pick it up if they want or they can pay five dollars and seventy five cents um, to have it delivered which is no more than the cost of a cab really. Um, the thing there is that it doesn't go up as the cost of the meal goes up. So if someone spends two hundred dollars on a meal and you spend twenty percent, that's forty dollars. With this, that delivery would cost you five dollars and seventy-five cents. So it's a very um, it's a very consumer friendly thing, and of course the consumer can choose which of the two they want, pickup or delivery. Outside of New York City and some other big cities, we have cars. Philly, there's lots of people that have cars and drive. Um, so the the restaurant can opt if they want to um, do carry out. So um, it's very restaurant friendly. We've added over 2,000 restaurants um, in the past uh, 12 weeks. And were these restaurants that you added on previously working with the other bigger known companies? Many of, the, many of them were. Um, many of them were also restaurants that never offered carry out before. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole new kind of elevated carry out that's been created here where you have restaurants in Los Angeles and San Francisco and whatnot that were mid tier restaurants, you know, where there was sit down dining. Uh, um, that were a check average where you weren't sending like burgers and fries out the back door, ribs or pizzas or something. And so now there's this whole new elevated dining. We have um, about 10 farms that sell direct to consumers now. Um, we have galleries going on. Um, so all sorts of different ways to, um, to figure out how to control inventory and get it to consumers in this very unusual time. But I think a lot of it is here to stay and it will stick around for the long term. Interesting. David, when you started signing people up for Black and Mobile, did you find that they were transitioning from other delivery services to you, or were they just never on delivery services to begin with? Um, it was a mixture. Some people were never on delivery services, and they only utilized my service. Some of them were on what they were on every service, so they had all four of them. I mean, I think maybe five sometimes, but some of them are all of them. Some of them are just using a couple of them. So it just really depends on which restaurant. But some of them, you know, like I said, some of them just exclusively delivered with me, so. Interesting. Laura, I know that you've done a lot of research when it comes to delivery apps. I know that you've written a lot about it, especially during the pandemic. I'm wondering in the course of your research, did you ever find that restaurants were saying that despite doing this increase in takeout that they're still losing money just because of the fees? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so when I talk to restaurant operators, they generally say that with delivery, um, this is before the pandemic, during the pandemic, um, they find themselves basically breaking even at best, um, but they think of it as a marketing opportunity. And I think it's kind of, there's this peer pressure that you need to be on these apps in order to, um, you know, please your customers because they, they go on there and they're looking for you. They want you to be on there. Um, and so everyone kind of feels pressure to join. Um, but saying, you know, it's, it's just like marketing is kind of in the journalism world where, um, let's say a freelance writer pitched me a story and I couldn't offer them much money, but I said, hey, I'll pay you an exposure. Um, you know, that's not great, right? Um, and during the pandemic, um, you know, it was frustrating to see um, a lot of the delivery apps um, were delayed in, um, being compliant in laws that were passed in local jurisdictions that um, asked them to lower their commission fees during this very, very hard time for restaurants. While restaurants were struggling, there's more delivery business happening than ever before. And, and so I think everyone was looking to kind of um, spread out some of the economic blow. Um, in DC, I did a lot of reporting on Postmates, who was the last holdout um, and coming down to our 15% fee. It took a couple stories and a couple fines, but they finally got there. Um, and you know everyone's trying to make money, but um, you know you have to follow the law. Um, but yeah, all in all, um, even with the increased um, delivery, while everyone's at home ordering, um, restaurants are still struggling. Okay. And is that the feedback that you are both getting, Nick and David, from your restaurants as well, even though you have these reduced fees? I guess I'll start. Well, I know for me, one of the restaurants they said that you know during the pandemic. And compared to other services that we help save really help help their business save it and keep their employees because we charge you know a 20 percent rate but they're not losing money because we let them go from the price of food so most of the restaurants are happy you know they have really no complaints i've never had one complaint by anyone saying well it's too high right now um you know i can't pay 20 percent because we allow them to go up so i haven't really had any complaints about it 
I'm um, actually have positive feedback that we let them go up on the person who. Right. Have you ever had customers coming to you and asking you why the price of food is higher on delivery than it is in the restaurant? Um, no, most people understand that with third party services, they're going to pay more. Um, you know, we try to get our delivery fee as low as possible. That's why our new system that's launching tomorrow, it'll just strictly calculate their distance from the restaurant. So the, shorty, the, the, the farther you are, the more, the shorter you are, the less money you're going to pay. So then that's really the best, the best structure we can do. So, you know, we make money, the restaurant makes money. And so the customer doesn't pay, you know, a whole bunch of more money on top of that. But we don't really go up that much. Like, for example, if it's $10, it's only going up to $12, you know, so two more bucks is not going to kill anyone, but it does add up over time. But I haven't had any complaints on, you know, well, this is too expensive now, or, you know, stuff like that. I really had too many complaints about it. That's good. And what about you, Nick? How are restaurants communicating with you in terms of uh, what their bottom line is like with delivery and takeout? Well, it's, it's a full spectrum and it changes um, week to week, month to month. Um, I know in April and May, when a lot of cities were closed down, delivery was the only option for not cooking in your own home. And so a lot of restaurants that pivoted very early, we started offering a delivery at my restaurants on our pickup on, at, at, on March 18th. Um, by April, we were doing thousands of carry out meals every day. And we were able to employ the entirety of our staff across 300 employees. Um, what happened is that as Chicago and other cities have lifted restrictions on patio dining and some places indoor dining, um, you you see a, a drop in, in in carry out delivery. So over the past four to six weeks, we've seen carry out nationally go down 40, 50 to percent from the peak in um, May. Um, and that was expected. And then what's happened, of course, is that unfortunately, as cities um, are considering relocking, or as in California, they got rid of the indoor dining, carry out becomes more important again. So what I always tell all the restaurants that we work with is that you in order to build a bridge to the future past this pandemic and, and try to keep as many people employed as possible, you need to do a robust patio service when the weather's good in the Northern climate, you know, LA will be fine in January, Chicago will not. Um, we need to um, keep a robust business going and carry out uh, as best as possible. You know, at the peak, Olinia was doing um, 1,250 carry out meals a night. Right now we're doing about 250. That is a huge drop but it was expected. I expect that it will go back up in the fall as the weather turns. Um, and I've told our teams and I tell all the restaurants um, in DC, there's a really a wonderful restaurant called Seven Reasons that is on talk that is doing a really robust business. They're being very, very nimble about creating new opportunities, new experiences for consumers, new ways to engage almost weekly. Um, and so some restaurants are doing a great, great, great job of it and having literally record revenues ever. Um, and some are, are struggling and that's, I think par for the course right now is as our conditions change all over the country week to week. Right. I think it's probably fair to also note that a lot of the places that are doing record business right now are ones that perhaps were very hard to get into and situations were normal, you know, reservations were hard to get, or you couldn't imagine like saving up that much money to spend in one night and suddenly it's takeout, it's carry out. No, you know, it's, it's so it could be, accessible. it could be, I mean, that's, tr that's true of Alenia, but, um, there's like a, a restaurant in upstate New York that had never done carry out and on a good weekend night, they would do three or $4,000. And they were, you know, a small family owned business with like 10 employees. Um, their carry out operation during the pandemic went to doing $30,000 a night. No one's ever heard of them. Um, and they fed their whole city, you know, small, small, mid, you know, mid sized city um, and hired 20 more people. So what's weird now is that that as their as their city is reopening, they're going wait 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 like why is no one ordering carry out anymore? So their carry out has dropped. But you don't need to be famous to do it. What you need to do is you need to own your consumer data. You need to understand how to how to leverage um, social media and email marketing so that you know who your consumers are and you can re-engage them. And a lot of these third party apps, what they don't do is that they don't tell the restaurant, you know, here's Joe Smith and here's his email address and here's his phone number, and you don't own all of that data. So one of the important things that Talk does is it lets you do that marketing to your customers because we, we're fully transparent. We, don't, we have a platform, exploretalk.com. It sends millions of people to, to these places, um, but we always say, here's your customers. They're your customer, not Talk's customer. And so that remarketing is the most important thing a restaurant can do. And some are very good at it and some, some are not, some are learning. Is it fair to say that some of the big 
bigger competitors in delivery space are not doing that, like their that's own correct. customer data? Yeah, they, they claim that, you know, we got the customer and that's why we can charge 20 to 30 percent. And you just know that you get like, you know, someone picks it up and you got the order and that's about it. You don't get, you have the customer's name, but you don't have their email address. You can't cross reference with their social media and all of that. Um, and that's the most important thing of all. Um, you know, it's like these networks aren't really the network. The real networks are social media and Google. Mm -hmm. David, how long has that's Black and Mobile been? Oh, sorry. David, how long has Black and Mobile been in business now? Uh, 17 months. Okay. So it's been, a, it's been a while. It's been before the pandemic. How are you working to sort of empower your customers that are restaurants? Uh, so you, you, I'm sorry, uh, you said empower the restaurants? Right. Like, for example, Talk is giving the restaurants customer information and full transparency. Is, does Black & Mobile do anything similar to that? Uh, some restaurants do ask. Like some restaurants, you know, he, he's correct on, you know, a lot of services do not give them all the information. Now, I'm pretty sure all of my restaurant partners can at least see their name and address on the system that we have. But I'm not going to say because, honestly, I worry about more of the delivery end. I know there's like an email confirmation that they all get. And I think it states, because I know there's one restaurant called Diaya's. She always knows exactly when we call in the customer's name and what they order. So I'm pretty sure they do get information. Um, but we, we really just focus on, you know, helping them, you know, be seen. You know, be, uh, they're underrepresented businesses, a lot of them. You know, there are some big, you know, black-owned businesses, but a lot of them are small, underfunded. So really what we try to do is just create a, create a, a platform where anyone can just go and find them and support them. It doesn't matter what race you are, just if you want to support a black owned business that is just not even during Black Lives Matter movement or pandemic, just in general, they're struggling and we just want to create a platform where anyone can go there and support them. But we do, you know, I don't have any kind of rules saying, oh, well, we don't, we make, don't give them their email and don't give them their, I don't really look into that or care about that personally, but I know there is a big thing where a lot of other services that I heard do not give that information to them. Mm -hmm. So Black and Mobile, we're, we're seeing that as more personalized, more of a place to really celebrate these businesses and drive awareness. So like Laura was saying, it, it, it does in some respects act as a really powerful marketing tool. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, it's definitely played into my advantage. I mean, all, all the press, I, I have like 85,000 uh, followers on Instagram and it's all been organic. I haven't reached out to a single person, like news people, whether it's the Black Enterprise, BT, all the news channels, Fox. Uh, CBS, they all reach out to me to do articles with me. So, you know, it, it, it helps me, you know, my niche helps me instead of just focusing on everything and everyone, focusing on the people that really need the help and it's been, you know, working to my advantage. Great. Now let's pivot a little bit to talk about safety. So not just in terms of what the restaurants are doing to keep things safe in terms of packaging and so on, but delivery drivers. Laura, I believe that you wrote a piece pretty recently on um, what people are doing to keep delivery drivers safe. And unfortunately, it, it wasn't all that much. Can you elaborate on that? Hi, yeah. Um, so you have to keep in mind, you know, the, the couriers are a really important part of this equation. and. I think often in the third party delivery world, um, they lose the blame game that everyone plays. You know, whenever something goes wrong with an order, it's, is it the restaurant's fault? Is it the driver's fault? Is, you know, it's, um, and they seem to always kind of run the losing end of that. Um, and these people are independent contractors. They have no employee benefits. They largely don't receive very much training and they really have to hustle to kind of make any semblance of a living. Um, so it won't surprise you that, um, you know, during, COVID-19, um, they haven't had the access to PPE that they've um, been promised. Um, so when I, you know, reached out to representatives at some of the big third-party apps, they always say, sure, we've created these kits. They have sanitizer, they have masks, they have um, gloves. Um, but then you know, the drivers say, oh, we've never seen that stuff. So either they're not following through on their promise or they're poorly communicating what's available. Um, and the one example that was frustrating is Uber Eats said, yeah, we have all this, this great stuff for them that'll keep them safe. Um, they can come and pick them up at our green, green light hubs, I, I believe they're called. Um, those are kind of in every city, there's like a little place that's home base for these drivers. Um, but then you go to the website and they said all of these centers were closed during the pandemic. So it's just, this is kind of um, 
circle. Um, so you really feel for these folks who are going in and out of restaurants, in and out of apartment buildings. Um, you know, they, they say that, um, you know, what's the contactless delivery is preferred, uh, where they'll just kind of leave your food on your stoop and then um, leave. Um, so there's not even a handoff. But um, reality, I'm not sure that's happening. Um, so it's really hard um, to take a job that was already so difficult. Um, and then add this pandemic and then add the fact that, you know, they're dependent on tips um, and it's just, it's a very, very hard job. Um. That's difficult. So just to wrap up, we kind of want to know, like, what are some pieces of advice that each of you have for delivery services that are popping up across the country and for the bigger delivery services on how to make it a better experience for restaurants in particular? I can go. I'll just, I'll um, jump in. Um, my biggest thing that I'm hearing about is I think it's really important for delivery companies to, to get buy-in from their restaurants. They need to have a conversation. Yes, we want to be on your platform to have that consent because um, I believe there's been a few class action lawsuits even where, um, you know, these delivery platforms are grabbing people's menus. They, they may be old menus. In DC, we had a, a bakery that, um, Postmates took their like wedding cake menu and put it on the um, delivery platform. And then you had, you know, stoners at home that were ordering three tier wedding cakes and expecting them in 40 minutes. Um, so I think I would like to see um, that done better amongst the big delivery platforms and then small ones um, like Black and Mobile. And we have DC Logo in DC. I just think like a really kind of um, better communication between restaurants and the, and the delivery apps. I see that Nick is smiling because I believe that that happened to you about a month or two ago, right, Nick? Yeah, Yelp, yeah, Yelp did that to my <laughs> restaurants, and I shut down Yelp's entire program with three tweets. Um, I, I remember that. <laughs> and uh, I will, I will say, um, it is not. Uh, we cannot expect the the third party delivery apps, um, other than the market forces of quick, quick things like Hawk charging three percent and disrupting them, to do these things voluntarily. However, I will put the onus on the restaurant owners. Get your head out of your rear, bluntly. Support the businesses that are, are working with you, um, like David's, like Talk. Um, and it's on, the onus is on them. Um, you do not need to be on five delivery platforms. People find you on Google. Um, they find you on social media. They know you because you're part of their, their neighborhood. They, they already go to your restaurant. You don't need to do all of that. So what you need to do is find someone that you work with, create an elevated experience, change it frequently, make sure your packaging is wonderful. Make sure that when they open that bag, there's like a little note in there or something just to give a little sense of emotional connection. So much of what we do at restaurants is about an emotional connection, not just, um, not just, you know, uh, uh, not just eating. On, on David's site on Black and Mobile, it says the culture delivered. It doesn't say food delivered. It says culture delivered. I'm sure that that's what he's, that's what his anchor is into that community. Right. And so it's the same thing. I tell every restaurant, make sure that you know what you do really well and then think, don't just throw it in a box and send it out the door and put it on the back of some moped of a third party delivery place that doesn't care about your, that experience. Create a really wonderful experience that creates an emotional connection with your customers and then work with somebody who can create that elevated experience on a computer and on a phone so that the UX is really wonderful, so that the experience is wonderful, um, two-way text messaging built in, like all of those sorts of things that are really, really important. That's how we built Talk from, from the get-go. That's how we built Talk to go. Um, and we are converting you know, you know, several hundred restaurants a week off the third-party delivery apps. They're making more money, but they're actually selling more too. It's not just better margin, it's actually better revenue. That's my rant. <laughs> David, any final words of advice for restaurants, especially black owned businesses that you wanna work with? All right, sorry, I, I'm not gonna lie, I was, I'm super tired. I'm on like a couple of hours of sleep. So, <laughs> so sorry if I was making too much noise, but um, yeah, I mean, really how, what we do, you know, coming from, from a perspective of helping black businesses, like you said, you know, it says the culture delivered. Um, really, I would just suggest, you know, to really, I like the point where we say you don't need five delivery services. You really don't. 
And I really think that, you know, for black businesses, we build these businesses up from, from, from nothing. You know, I built my business up from nothing. I don't have anyone funding me. I'm 100% owned. I don't have an investor. I don't have anyone giving me money. So same thing with a lot of these restaurants where they're starting from nothing. And then here comes these big corporations coming and taking 30, 35% from something they built up from the ground up. So, you know, I, I think that just, uh, as restaurant owners, um, like restaurant owners, just be more firm with saying, I'm not giving you 35%. I'm not giving you 30%. You know, I know, I know that, you know, maybe I'm not as big as, you know, your platform, but, you know, I think 20, I think 20% and I boosted up to 20 because, you know, now my platform is more secure and, uh, you know, just brings more volume. But I think anything above 20, I just don't think it's fair. So I think just, you know, black restaurant owners just taking a stance and any restaurant owner, it doesn't have to just be black people in general. I see a bunch of businesses getting charged 30%. You know, and I'm and I I can't really speak on other restaurant owners, but I don't think it's fair to charge thirty percent. You know, because then, for example, the re the customer is going to pay more than that. And so I think a twenty percent increase, it doesn't it doesn't kill someone's pockets, um, as long as you can get the delivery fee a little lower. But that's my advice to restaurant owners: just you know, just stand firm on not giving up thirty percent. You know, because they they need you. And and to touch on the topic of adding menus, I've been there. I'm not gonna lie to you, I did it before. I've added restaurants menus without permission and try to get some delivery platform and I end up taking them all off. And I said to myself, if they don't want to do business with me, I don't want to do business with them. And it's nothing that, you know, I dislike them or I, I don't want to talk to them. It's just, it's just simple business. You know, I want to make sure that the customer doesn't suffer. You know, if I was trying to call an order and they're like, well, we don't do black and mobile. What's black and mobile? So we just want to work with people that work with us and make sure it's, it's, a, it's a good partnership, you know, and just try to really uh, expand both brands. Great. So there you have it. Be smart about the relationships that you build. Be smart about where your money is being spent and be firm to try and just make it a good experience for yourself and your customers. Thank you to Laura, Nick, and David for being with us today. We really appreciate all your insights and all of the hard work you're doing for the industry. And thank, thank you, you to our sponsors as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Have a, have a good one. See you later, everybody. See you.